Hello everyone, uh, welcome again to our study on God's providence uh, entitled Seeing the Hand of God. Uh, before I carry on, uh, let's just open in a word of prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, we come to rejoice in you. Uh, we thank you that you are our Heavenly Father, that you are a God of compassion and love, tenderness and care. Thank you that you provide us for, for our every need. Thank you that you protect us from the evil one. Thank you that you are preserving us. Uh, even to that great day when your son returns to take us home, uh, where we will see your glory and worship you together. Thank you, dear Lord, that in this life we are not alone, but that you are with us and you are guarding and leading us. That you are leading us by your powerful hand, upholding us and keeping us. Uh, dear Lord, we have so much to give thanks for, uh, to rejoice in uh, and to look forward to. And we come to praise and worship you even now as we come to the study again. Lead and guide us by your Spirit, uh, illuminate the Word to us, and may your heart, or may our hearts, uh, rejoice even more in your graces. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're looking at the eighth and uh, final lesson on our study on God's providence. Uh, I had initially planned to do a few more lessons, but I thought after some uh, consideration, uh, we had a good place to conclude this series and I trust we've, we've uh, covered enough to give you much food for thought and much encouragement to your heart. Of course, there's so much more we could be saying, so much more to look at and consider. But I trust that uh, what we have looked at in this series uh, would be an encouragement to you and would be used uh, by the Lord to draw you into a closer intimacy with Him and uh, enable you to uh, bear the weight of the various trials and afflictions we go through in this life. Uh, but in this particular lesson, our final lesson, I want to look at the advantages of seeing the hand of God. Uh, so far in this series, we started looking uh, at the series on God's providence, and we started looking at uh, the importance of God's providence. Uh, in the first lesson, we looked at how uh, it is the mark of God's people to study God's providence, and it is the mark of the unbeliever to neglect the providence of God. Uh, after that, we looked at uh, God's providence in general, and then God's providence uh, especially geared towards His people. Uh, after that, in the fourth lesson, we looked at how to meditate upon God's providence. And in the next three lessons, we looked at uh, God's dark providences, and we, in a sense, meditated upon God's dark providences. Well, in this final lesson, I want us to look at why we need to meditate upon God's providence. In fact, that's the purpose of this entire series, is so that we would be a people who meditate upon God's providence, who see His hand. And so in this particular lesson, I want us to ask why, why, what are the benefits or what are the advantages of seeing the hand of God? Uh, now, there are many that we could perhaps list and we could go uh, on for quite a while, but I want to draw your attention to six particular advantages of, of giving ourselves to this duty and the delight of meditating upon God's providence, of seeing God's hand in life and in this world. The first reason is this. Seeing God's hand leads to greater communion with God. Seeing God's hand, studying God's providence will lead you to a deeper and more intimate relationship with God where you see more of God and you can commune more with God. Uh, what do I mean with communion with God? Well, I mean particularly your relationship with God. And providence and the study of God's providence is a, a useful way of deepening your relationship with God. I thoroughly believe that. Uh, John Flavel, he makes this observation. He says, communion with God, properly and strictly taken, consists in two things. God's manifestation of himself to the soul and the soul's answerable returns to God. That is to say, communion with God consists of two things. Firstly, him manifesting himself to us and us responding to him. Now, we usually think of God revealing himself in creation, right? The heavens declare the glory of God. Or we think of God revealing himself in his word. Well, God also reveals himself in providence. He reveals himself, uh, his character and his desires in the workings of providence, uh, which is which are his works, remember. Uh, 
And so understanding God's providence and seeing God's hand is a way of communing with God because God in that is manifesting himself to us. So in God's providence, God manifests himself in two ways. He manifests himself in his dark providences. His dark providences reveal his, dis his discipline toward his people or his loving correction of his people. Or it reveals his displeasure with sin or his sanctifying wisdom. See, God's dark providences reveal much about him, of what he desires, of what he, he doesn't desire. The same holds true for his light providences, uh, the good things that he gives, the gifts that he provides, his light and uh, blessed prov providences. They reveal his graces, they reveal the abundance of his provision, they reveal his power in providing for his people. And so what we see in God's providences is God revealing himself. He is revealing something of, he, of who he is. But how should we respond to that? Well, we should respond in one of two ways. Firstly, in prayer, right? In, in dark providences, how ought we to respond? Uh, neglecting God or uh, forgetting about God? No. Grumbling against God? No. We must reach out to God in prayer. Often, as we mentioned last week uh, and in weeks before, that often in God's dark providences, those are used to draw us again to God. And so God's dark providences call upon us to reach out in prayer, and that way we are communing with God. See, even God's dark providence is calling for a response. Or when God gives us light providences or, or blessings, how ought we to respond? With praise and thanksgiving. Uh, when God gives us and answers prayers, we need to respond with praise and thankfulness. And see, as we grow in God's awareness, it deepens our communion with God because God's providence calls out our prayer and our praise. And see, if you are not aware of God's providence, if you aren't setting your eyes to see God's hand, then you will not be able to commune with God in these ways. See, uh, seeing God's hand, having an understanding of God's providence and seeking to meditate upon God's providence enables greater communion with God, greater ways of, of praising Him and praying to Him and, and seeing what He's doing and responding in response to what He's doing or praying in response to what He's doing. So what we need to be seeing is really God's providence is a useful means of deepening our relationship with God. And if, if God is distant to you, if God is uninvolved in your life, I would encourage you to take up the task of meditating upon His providence. Start seeing what He's doing in and around your life. It is through a meditation upon God's providence in which we grow and deepen our communion and our relationship with God. And, and we see this all over Scripture. We see this all over the Psalms. But let me give you one example at least. In Psalm 92, the psalmist here is rejoicing in God's works, the works of his hand. And it leads him to, to commune with God in praise and prayer and, and, and to rejoice in God. Listen to what the psalmist says, the first four verses of Psalm 92. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night to the music of the lute and the harp to the melody of the lyre. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the hands of your at the works of your hands I sing for joy. See the psalmist here is a picture of someone who is enjoying intimate communion with God. Night and day he is he's responding to God with worship. He's singing praises. He's giving thanks because his heart is set upon meditating upon God's works, upon looking and studying the works of God's hands with which he rejoices in. And so if you want something of that, if you want this communion that we see with the psalmist, then you need to give yourself to studying the providence of God. You need to be seeing God's hand. So that's one advantage of studying uh, the providence of God, of seeing the hand of God in all things. It, it deepens our communion with God. Secondly, seeing God's hand produces joy in the Christian life. Let me say that again. Seeing God's hand produces joy 
in the Christian life. We read this psalm so many times already in the study. But Psalm 111 verse 2 says, Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. See, God's people delight in God's providences. And God's providences is a source of great joy and delight. And perhaps we should ask three questions. And these three questions, I think, will help us take joy in God's providence. And those questions are this. Do we not rejoice when we see God's when we see God accomplishing his plans? So we know in the scriptures God has revealed his plans for us. Uh, Romans 8:28, we've looked at it so many times, but his plan is to work all things together for the good of his people. And we see that sometimes when God accomplishes his plans in our lives, when he allows dark providences, and those providences produce something good in our life perhaps godly character or a godly outcome? Do we not rejoice when we see those plans accomplished? Well, yes, we see that. Or do we not rejoice when we see God's promises being fulfilled? Uh, 2 Corinthians one twenty one tells us that, that all of God's promises find their yes in Him. And we know that God isn't a man or son of man that He would lie or change His mind. He, he keeps His promises. And so God's providences are often a fulfillment of His providence, promises. And when we see promises fulfilled, does that, does that not produce joy in us? The same applies with, God, with prayer, right? Do we not rejoice when we see God answering prayer? In John 16, 23, Jesus says, He says there, Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, He will give it to you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Do we not experience something of that joy when we see God answering prayer? Perhaps it's something you've prayed for weeks or years and God finally answers it. Doesn't that create great joy in your heart? And see, God's providence creates joy in the Christian life. Because God's providence is often moved and often flows from His plans, the plans that He accomplishes. It often flows and moves because of His promises that He keeps. It often flows and moves in answer to prayer. See, God has revealed His plans for us. He has given us His promises and He has given us the assurance of answered prayer. Therefore, the Christian who studies God's providences has fuel for joy because God's providences flow from His plans. It flows from His promises. It flows from His answered prayer, from Him answering prayer. And so let us see this and rejoice uh, in studying God's providences. It will create joy in our heart. Uh, it, it's a source of great joy in the Christian life. If you want fuel for greater joy, then study God's providences, particularly how God's providences accomplish His plans, fulfill His promises, and answer prayer. Now John Flavel, he makes this comment, What a transporting pleasure it is to behold great blessings and advantage, advantages to us wrought by providence out of those things that seem to threaten our ruin or misery, and yet, by duly observing the ways of providence, you may, to your singular comfort, find it so. That is to say, basically saying, as we study and observe God's providence, we find tremendous joy and pleasure out of it, because God proves faithful. He proves faithful to His promises, His plans, and the prayers of His people. So we need to see uh, the advantage of studying God's providence, of seeing God's hand. It creates joy in the Christian life. Thirdly, seeing God's hand strengthens weak faith. Seeing God's hand strengthens weak faith. Let's be honest, there is in every heart a seed of atheism. There is that seed of unbelief and doubt. Uh, in each of us, there is this tendency, especially when we go through dark providences, often to wonder if God still loves us or if God still cares for us. Uh, and that's something we often wrestle with. Well, providence helps still that voice. It helps quiet that doubting thought or that, that atheistic thought. 
uh, providence stills that voice because it reminds us that God is in control, that God is wise and just and has a good plan, and that God is, even in the dark providences, changing and transforming us for the good. And by implication, providence becomes therefore a great support for our faith. It strengthens weak faith. We often, like the disciples in the boat, have little faith. Yet providence is a great means because it builds up that faith. Unbelief is a, a thing we often struggle with and wrestle with. In unbelief, we often question God's ability to provide. We often think that God is unable to overcome a particular situation. In unbelief, we often question God's grace uh, to care for us. We often think that God no longer cares or loves us. Or in unbelief, we highlight our sinfulness. Maybe the evil one comes and he tells you, oh, look how sinful you are. Look how wicked and corrupt you are. Or unbelief highlights our weakness. We often think, oh, look how weak and frail I am. I can't, I can't uh, do this by myself. My prayers are weak. My faith is weak. You see, we struggle with unbelief. We struggle with weak faith. But God's providence is given to us and we ought to study God's providence because it allows us to build up our faith. It allows us to strengthen our weakened faith. See, when we doubt, we need to be asking ourselves a few questions. And there are many questions we can be asking. But there are four questions I want us to ask. When we doubt, we need to ask ourselves, firstly, has God not provided for you in your need? I think back on your past. Has, not on me, has God not on many occasions provided for you? Oh, God has said that He has promised that He will provide. We see that promise in Psalm 111 verse 5. God has provided for you in your past and He will provide for you. Or we need to be asking ourselves when we doubt, has God not preserved you in danger? How many times have you been in danger? How many times have you been exposed to danger? Yet God has preserved you. Again, God has promised to preserve His people. And so, again, look at God's providence in your life. He has preserved you on many occasions. And therefore, still your doubts by looking back and considering His preservation. Or thirdly, ask yourself, has God not answered your prayers? How many times has God not answered prayer? Uh, perhaps you've had this burden on your heart and a burden in your life, and you've prayed and God has removed it. Well, God has answered prayer. And so to overcome doubt, to, to strengthen your weak faith, look again to providence. Look how God has answered prayer. And finally, when you struggle with doubt and unbelief, uh, ask yourself, has God not owned you as His own? Has He not purchased you with the precious blood of the Son of, of the Lord Jesus Christ? Has God not made you His own? Are you not His covenant people? Therefore, still the doubts of, of unbelief uh, with these kind of questions by looking to the providence of God. See, God's providence is a helpful means to strengthen our weakened faith, our little faith. The fourth advantage of, of studying and meditating upon God's providence is this. Uh, seeing God's hand endures Jesus to our hearts. Uh, seeing God's hand, studying God's providence endures Jesus, endures Jesus to our hearts. That is to say, if we give ourselves to the observation of God's providence, we would be better prepared to treasure Jesus. We'd be better prepared to, to grow in love and, and in, our, in our devotion to Christ. And there are a few reasons why I say this. Uh, firstly, when we understand God's providence, we need to understand that Christ is providentially ruling now. Colossians 1, 16-17 says this, For by Him, referring to Christ, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, with the thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through Him and for Him, and He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. So we see Christ is upholding this universe. Christ is moving and, and constraining all things for His good and ultimate glory. So Christ is providentially ruling. And this uh, comes out in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3 as well. Uh, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature. And He upholds the universe by the word of His power. So we see Christ is providentially ruling. Christ is the one who is moving in this world. It's His hand governing and guiding all things. And not only is Christ the, the sovereign ruler who rules in providence, but Christ is the source of all blessings of God's providence. 
Uh, Hebrews chapter, or Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And so what I want us to see is by studying God's providence, we are therefore, or studying God's providence is a way therefore of seeing how Christ is working in and around your life which will in return stir your affections and love for Christ. See, we mustn't just think of God's providence as something abstract and general, but really of God in Christ ruling and governing all things. And therefore, when we study God's providence, when we set ourselves to see the hand of God in all things, we need to be seeing Christ's work. We need to see how Christ is upholding and governing all things. And when we see it that way, then we will be able to uh, to grow in our devotion to Christ and have our affections stirred for Christ more. We need to remember this, that the blessings of God's providence all flow from Christ. They flow from the purchase of Christ's blood. Christ has purchased our peace and reconciliation with God. Once we were alien and alienated and separated from God, uh, strangers to the covenants of grace, once we were without God and without without hope in this world. Yet Christ has purchased by His blood our peace and reconciliation. Uh, so the blessings of God's providence flow from Christ's blood for us. Secondly, we, uh, the blessings of providence flow from our union with Christ. In Christ, we have been given every spiritual blessing, as we've already noted. Uh, Christ is the vine, and as we, are, you, as we abide in Him, we are fruitful and, and have a life and are nourished. And so all God's blessings of providence flow through to us from Christ and our union with Christ. And not just that, the blessing of God's providence has flowed to us from Christ's intercession for us. Uh, he is the high priest seated at the right hand of the Father and He's interceding for us. He's sanctifying our prayers. He's answering our prayers. And so all the blessings of providence and even the dark providences they are governed by Christ and they flow from Christ. Uh, every blessing flows from Christ. And so, therefore, by studying God's providence, by setting our minds to see the hand of God in life, that will allow us to, to really treasure Christ more, to love Him more. And so let us see providence as a way to set our hearts and our affections again upon Christ. Fifthly, uh, a fifth advantage of studying God's promise, providence is this. Seeing God's hand produces thankfulness. Again, this almost goes without saying, right? As we see the works of God, God's hands, that ought to produce thankfulness. And we've already looked at Psalm 92, where the psalmist there gives thanks to the Lord because of his works. And so we need to be a thankful people. But I, I want to suggest we will grow in thankfulness when we compare how God has been good to us in comparison to other things. So here are three things to compare. Uh, firstly, compare God's provision for creation with God's provision for His people. Uh, we've looked at Matthew 6 where Jesus says, look at the birds of the air, uh, how God provides for them. How much more so will He not provide for us? And so compare the way that God cares for creation with how He cares for you. He cares more for you than all of creation. You are His special child. And therefore, be, give thanks. Uh, rejoice uh, in God's special provision to you, His people. Also, compare the way God treats His enemies in common grace and compare that with God's special grace to you. God gives if, if God gives special grace to his enemies, those who are ungodly, and he still provides for them, well, how much, mo how much more so will God not provide for you, his special people? In fact, we, when we looked at God's special providence, we saw how God specially rules and governs all things for his people. And so again, compare the, how God treats his enemies to how he treats you, and that should cause great joy and thankfulness in your heart uh, when you consider that. Or compare how God treats you with how you have treated God. Think of that for a second. Uh, God has been so faithful to us. God has been so benevolent to us. God has been so gracious. And compare that with how we have treated God. 
How often we have been disobedient. We have been so neglectful of His graces. We have been so unthankful. Yet despite our sin, despite our waywardness, God proves faithful. And see, when we think about that, when we make that comparison, I would suggest our hearts should be filled with thankfulness. Uh, truly, uh, thankfulness would be the mark of our lives if we compare just how God has uh, loved us and cared for us and been gracious to us in comparison to the way He treats creation, He treats His enemies, and how we have treated Him. Truly, thankfulness would be the mark of our life when we make these comparisons. But again, God's providence, by studying God's providence, by seeing His good hand, by seeing how He's working out all things for the good, that ought to produce thankfulness in us. And then, that's an advantage. Uh, God delights in His people to be a thankful people. The mark of the unbeliever is their unthankfulness. And therefore, studying God's providence is, an, is to your advantage because it will conform you more and more into the image of His Son and make you a person pleasing in the sight of the Lord because it makes you more thankful. Sixthly and finally, here's another advantage of giving yourself to studying God's providence. And that is simply this, seeing God's hand produces greater peace. Isn't that something all of us want? All of us long for peace. All of us long for uh, inward tranquility, even in the midst of trial and difficulty. Well, studying and meditating on, upon God's providence uh, gives that peace. It produces that peace and that tranquility that we so long for. But how, do we, how does studying God's providence produce that? Well, it does so by seeing God's character in His providence. We need to remind ourselves that when God works out His providential plans, He does so consistent with His character. God is holy. God is good. God is just. He's loving. He's wise. He's sovereign. And therefore, the works of His hands, His providence, is characterized by those attributes. His providences are holy, they are good, they are just, they are loving, they are wise, they are sovereign. And so when we consider just who God is in His attributes, that should give us peace. Because we know that even in dark providences, even in the difficult things of life, God is still who He's always been. He's still a God of holiness, of goodness, of justice, of love, wisdom, and sovereign power. See, God's character, God's attributes, I think, gives us peace. Who God is, is the source of one of, our, is one of the greatest sources of our peace, of our comfort, of our joy. And we see this in uh, the example of David, don't we? David is a man who finds great peace in who God is. And we too, therefore, need to find peace in who God is. Uh, consider Psalm uh, 4, verse 8. Uh, David here is surrounded by enemies who, are, who desire his life and who are prospering. Yet David finds peace and tranquility even in the midst of enemies. He says, in peace I will both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. See, David is someone who trusts in God's sovereignty. He trusts in God's providence. He trusts in God's character. And therefore he can be at peace even in the midst of trial. Or Psalm 16 uh, verse 8 and 9, David says, I've set the Lord always before me. Because He is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. See, David is a person who sets the Lord always before him. God's character, God's sovereignty is a source of David's peace even in the midst of trial. And what I want to suggest to you is this, studying God's providence and setting your eyes to see God's head is, in a sense, setting God always before you. It is living life theologically. Uh, uh, it is living a life in a God-centered way. Uh, the ancient church, uh, the early church fathers, when they spoke of theology, they weren't referring to uh, uh, head knowledge. They were referring to a way of life. To, to be theological is to live a life geared toward God. 
and the natural result of living before God, of living Coram Deo, before the face of God, of living a God-centered life, is greater peace. It is greater tranquility even in the midst of trial. And so if we are to study God's providence, if we give ourselves to study God's providence, if we see that God is with us and governing all things for us, that will give us peace. That will give us tranquility even in the midst of difficulty. Another psalm that really speaks to this is Psalm 46, uh, the first three verses. There we read, uh, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and firm, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. See, we, when we set God always before us, when we realize that God is with us, He's governing and, and, and upholding creation, and He's upholding us as His people, that gives us comfort. That gives us great uh, joy and, and, and strength in difficulty. God is our refuge. God is our strength, a very present help in trouble. And so given the peace that is ours uh, in God as our refuge and strength, let us give ourselves to the duty of, of studying God's providence, of seeing His hand in all things. And so in conclusion, and a conclusion to this entire series, I want to again give you this exhortation. Um, it's the exhortation I gave in the beginning of the series, and I want to give it to you again, because this is my desire for the series, so that as we consider uh, this life, as we live this life, as we go through the trials of this life, we would be a people who, who see something of God even in trials. And so this is the exhortation that I lay before you uh, in this series. With the eyes of faith and with minds conformed to the word, we must give ourselves the duty and delight of seeing God's hand of providence. See, by giving ourselves to this duty and delight, there is great advantage for us as God's people. Uh, this duty, uh, this delight of meditating upon God's providence will strengthen our communion with God. It will give us greater joy in the Christian life. It will build up our faith. It will uh, endure Christ more to our hearts. It will produce thankfulness in our lives. And ultimately and beautifully, it will give us tremendous peace in difficulty. And so, beloved, let me uh, encourage you with this. Uh, do not live this life without an awareness of God's providence. Do not seek to live uh, this life and the trials of life and the difficulties of life without an awareness that God is providentially in charge. God is ruling all things. Uh, to live life in that way, to, to be uh, ignorant and neglectful of this doctrine, is to cut yourself off from God. It is to live in practical atheism. And so let me encourage you, uh, take up this duty, take up this delight, study God's providence, see His hand at work in your life, and you will be encouraged, you will be strengthened. Let me close by two quotes again. Alexander Carson makes this exhortation, he gives this quote, which I th think is uh, valuable for us to take note of. How chill and withering is the breath of that obnoxious philosophy that would detach our minds from viewing God in his works of providence. The Christian who lives in this atmosphere, that is the atmosphere of, of not giving thought to God's providence, he says, the Christian who lives in this atmosphere or on the borders of it will be unhealthy and unfruitful in the true works of righteousness. This malaria destroys all spiritual life. See, that's how important the doctrine of God's providence is and studying God's providence is. is it gives spiritual life to the believer. And let me close by giving you this quote that I started off with in our first lesson, this quote by Calvin, which I think really summarizes my heart for this series. And that is this, nothing is more useful than to know of this doctrine. And there is nothing better for us in our adversity than to give ourselves to meditation upon the providence and judgment of God.
And so, beloved, uh, let us give ourselves to this duty, to this delight. And I trust that you would have been encouraged by this series and that you'd be encouraged even in the days in which we live, in the trials and difficulties of life, to give time, to give thought, to give effort into studying the hand of God, to see God's hand in all things. May God bless uh, this study to our hearts. May he conform us more and more to his image. And may you be blessed in this. And let me close in prayer for us. Father, we do want to thank you that you are a God who is sovereign, that you're a God who in his sovereignty rules and governs all things. I thank you that you're a God who is not detached and disinterested in our lives, but rather you are upholding and governing all things. You are moving all things for our good and your glory. And thank you, dear Lord, for this series. Thank you that in this series we could have meditated upon some aspects of your providence, uh, and so that also in this series we, we would be exhorted, exhorted to, to greater conformity to, to your ways and your word. And I pray, dear Lord, that you would just so impress this series and this message upon your people's hearts, upon your church, uh, that your church would uh, so live uh, in the light of your sovereignty, in the light of your providence, so that it would give glory and honor to you in all things. Uh, dear Lord, we praise you and thank you. We thank you for all the comfort that this doctrine gives us, for all the hope that it gives us. And we ask, dear Lord, that you would continue to uh, impress this upon our hearts, that you continue to speak to us and give us the eyes to see your hand in all things. The praise and honor of your name. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.